I know that it was a really, really long week. A lot of work happened, but actually we are so happy that we are okay, inter interviewing you here in Kaos and in Saudi Arabia. Um, all of those students want to uh, share some thoughts, actually, from all of the previous couple of days. If you don't mind, I'll pass the mic in order to have some of their questions. I will start by. Shaik. Um, hi. Manarat. Oh, Manarat Riyadh. Okay. Okay. So I have a question for you guys. So what is the funniest moment you've had in space? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, you know, space is a pretty serious place, and I always flew with, a, with very serious crews. So there wasn't a lot of levity. There was a lot of business being conducted in space during our missions. And, I mean, if there was any, I don't know that there was any one area that was particularly funny. You know, maybe on, on my last mission, we had um, a 14-day mission, so NASA provided a four-hour block where we were technically off, right? It was our day off. It was limited to four hours. But they always bothered us with, you know, ground communications and those kinds of things. We wanted us to just flip this switch or do this activity. <clears throat> so we built a little... Uh, model of an astronaut out of one of our experiments uh, consisted of a, of a truss structure of the International Space Station and we put the helmet on him and we set him in the commander seat and so if Mission Control Center called up we just try, you know pass the, the mic over to him so but other than that we were pretty serious crews always and not a lot of levity but now KT I think has a whole different experience so I'm gonna let her comment about that yeah, I had a lot of fun crews. So the first crew I was on, where there were five of us, and one of the things we did is there's the, the flight deck up there. That's where the pilot and commander fly the thing from. And then the mid deck is below, and there's a hatch on each side to get up there. And so we would sort of do time trials around that loop and see how fast we could move around there without hurting somebody. And the other fun thing to do is to play with your food. And so one of the things you could do is, let, is release a handful of M&Ms and pretend like you're fish and go at it, you know, <laughs> without using your hands. <laughs> or release a drop of um, a drink, liquid, in the air. It forms sort of a bubble, and it floats around for a while, and then you sort of sneak up on it and, <laughs> and drink it like that. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I will give an uh, opportunity to one of the boys to ask questions, and then I'll back to the girls. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fahad Sultan Saidi, Manarat Riyadh International Schools. So my question is, how do you see the future of space exploration uh, evolving, and how do you think commercial space companies will contribute? So there are a lot of exciting things that are going to happen for the future for the space exploration. So you know that we're going back to the moon and that there are many missions as well for Mars, and even some satellites that are again being built for Venus to even explore further. But we're also looking outer, like to the outer solar system, and seeing if we can discover more about the universe itself. So I'm very excited to see the next 20, 30 years and see what's, uh, what's coming. And especially companies such as SpaceX, Blue Origin, uh, they will play major roles, but also Sierra Space, which, for example, is a company that's making inflatable habitats. So you actually don't need a fixed structure anymore, but you can just use a big balloon to live in. So I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. My name is Lana Al Amr from Manrat Real Schools, and my question for today is, what would happen if food, ma if food crumbs make it to the vent? If the food makes it to the vents? Yeah, the crumbs. Sure. You want that one? Sure, I mean, we try and select our food so that they produce, you know, minimal crumbs and that kind of thing. Like, uh, we won't take crackers, for example, and or we don't take certain kinds of bread. We, we will use like tortilla shells as kind of our bread substitute because they, again, they don't really crumb. Um, now, having said that, y you know, one of the daily tasks twice a day for us on orbit is to vacuum all the filters. So, you know, things, you know, debris does float around up there all day. Things get away from you. Um, and, and then we have to go and vacuum that. Every day. It can be things like lint off your flight suits as well and, and other clothing. 
So that stuff finds its way into the filters, uh, and we vacuum those filters twice a day. The other thing is um, if you were to lose a, your spoon or your pen or something gets away from you, there's some places that we knew the air currents took things, and we call that the lost and found. <laughs> One of them is near the ceiling in the toilet, yeah, right. <laughs> and the other was on the other side near the filter, so those were the lost and found areas. So, so just to add on that from a medical perspective, it's very important that this is being cleaned because these skull pieces can get stuck in your eye and actually cause irritation, but also can go on your skin. And because there is no, like there is microgravity, it will stay on your skin and cause for irritation. So you see a lot of astronauts right now have actually like eczema or skin rations, uh, like irritations, just because of the, um, like these small particles getting stuck. Thank you. So and KT, help me out here. I remember a story one time about Hank Hartsfield and a razor blade. Do you remember that? No, I don't. Okay, so, so you know, we're very concerned about foreign object debris, foreign object damage, and it can be, like you said, as simple as crumbs, or it could be somebody goes in and does some work in the spacecraft, they forget a wrench. So we account for everything that goes into the, the crew cabin, um, the crew compartment, and everything has to come out, right, or be used while it's in there. So on, on one of the crew members, I believe it was Hank Hartsfield, he woke up during the night and there was a razor blade floating in front of him while he was asleep. And so that was something that had been left in the spacecraft during uh, ground processing operations that somehow found its way into a crack or crevice in the spacecraft, but on, on orbit came floating out and eventually was floating, free floating in, in the cabin. So foreign object damage, foreign object debris is something we pay a lot of attention to. What is the most challenging aspect of, spa of space travel that most people, might, most people might not be aware of? Um, In-flight press conferences is one that I did. <laughs> <laughs> was one that I found particularly challenging. Um, you know, I don't know. That's a very good question. I have to think about that. The, I would say the hardest thing about flying in space is saying goodbye to your family. And, and not being, we're in touch with them, we can talk to them, we could, in our day, we could send them emails every day, but, um, but we really weren't part of their lives, we were separate from them, so I found that to be pretty difficult. That, that's the reason I would not have taken on a Mars mission when my family was young. Maybe now I would. Hello, my name is Ruba Khayat from Manarat Riyal International Schools. And previously you've told us that your muscles kind of deteriorate when you're in space. So how do you stay physically fit and healthy during your space mission? We have, uh, on the shuttle, we had a, rec a recumbent bicycle. So it's interesting, you, would, you put on bicycle shoes, you would snap your feet into the pedals, and then you would strap yourself down to the seat, which seems kind of silly. But if you're on the seat, you could push against the back. So that gave you kind of a normal bicycling motion. If you unstrap from the seat, you would float up. Your feet would still be attached to the pedals, and you could still pedal. But that uses muscles that you don't normally use. That was a huge workout just to do you know, a few rounds of, of that kind of stuff when you were floating up. On the space station, I think they have some um, resistive exercises that they do. And, and they, have a, they have scheduled gym time every day because they really do have to keep that up. All right. And just to add on it, it is actually also a problem for the station to stay uh, to stay in orbit, because of these perturbations that are caused by the vibration of doing the exercises. You don't see the ISS going like this around the orbit. You actually see it hovering, like it goes up and down. So they constantly have to do corrections because of these vibrations, because of the astronauts exercising, and also lots of other uh, effects. Okay, so my name is uh, Raid Al Hadif from Manarat Al Riyadh International Schools, and I would like I would like to ask, what kind of entertainment do you have in space? <laughs> <laughs> well, usually your crew members provide enough entertainment there for, for all of us that, that uh, entertainment is not a problem. Uh, no, we do carry. Well, at least when I was flying, uh, we carried music tapes. You know, you guys wouldn't remember this anymore. They were long gone. They're probably in a museum now, but the Walkmans, uh, we had Walkmans and, and cassette tapes, tapes, cassette tapes <laughs> that we used uh, for entertainment. And of course, you can always read, and some people brought, you know, maybe a book or, or n not so much digital reading, because again, that didn't exist really at the time. So mostly, you know, a small book maybe, but, but usually the, the Walkman uh, provide that entertainment. And of course, the real entertainment 
was you know, looking out the window, right? Just literally watching the world go by. Yeah, so just to come back as well, because we talked about AR and VR, they're actually thinking of their, they're using as well VR glasses now to have some entertainment. Because you can watch a movie, for example, with your Oculus Quest, with your VR glasses. Or if you want to go to the jungle, or if you want to go and see the ocean, um, it actually really helps with the astronaut on a psychology level to actually get them some downtime using VR technology. Yeah, so th you know that's something that for shuttle we never really considered, and of course it d that technology didn't exist at the time, so that's easy. But when you consider like a, a moon mission or a space station mission, or in our case a shuttle mission, the world was always in view. Now, when we're talking about going on to Mars, right? Someone in this room may be the first person to venture off uh, to, to Mars, for example. You guys are in the right age group for that mission. That's a whole different psychological experience, right? Because when you look out, out the window on a trip to Mars, let's say you're midpoint to, to Mars, well, what are you going to see, right? Because the Earth is going to look like a distant planet. Mars will look like a distant planet. You're going to just see the star field. Right? So that's a whole different experience. Right? So to have that level of isolation and, and sensory deprivation of the things that we're normally used to seeing. Like I said, for us, it was easy. We looked out the window. We could watch the world go by. One last question. Hello, my name is Sana Hawassi from Manarat International Schools. And I was wondering, what were you feeling during taking your launch in space? Can you answer that? My question? Yes. My name is Sadeen Mohammed Al Ghabban from Manarat Riyadh International School. Uh, what was the pressure like in space? Temperature. Oh, the temperature. Mm. Okay, so and yours was what does it feel like on liftoff? Okay, so liftoff is a rough ride, right? And emotionally, um, you're you're tuned into the spacecraft. You, you've got a job to do. There's a lot of critical parameters that you're monitoring, making sure that we're meeting all of our. Um, you, abort boundaries and those, not to get too complicated, but you have range velocity lines. In other words, at this velocity, we should be this far down range. At this velocity, we should be this much further down, down range. For abort boundaries, we're this fast, this high, we should be able to go here, right? If we lose an engine, this, if, if failures start to ripple through the spacecraft. So during liftoff, that's 100% of your focus, 100% of your activity. You really don't have time to think about the human experience, except, again, you know, getting out of the atmosphere is a rough ride. And then it smooths out kind of as you accelerate out towards main engine cutoff. Um, temperatures inside the spacecraft are about 80 degrees. Inside the suit, they're closer to 100 degrees. The suit's not very comfortable. Outside during reentry, 2,500 degrees. And I'm going to let... KT, talk about you know your launch. I will say on my last flight, I had a mirrored kneeboard, and it was very cool to watch the world you know kind of disappear, the, the the launch pad disappear through the overhead windows behind us. Yeah. On my first flight, I was the only crew member on the mid deck. There were five of us, so four on the flight deck doing all the things Sam's talking about, and I was on the mid deck by myself, <laughs> lockers in front of my face. You can't see out a window. And so I would just look at my watch and go, okay, two and a half minutes, we're not going back to Florida. You know, another abort boundary, six minutes, we're not going to Africa. <laughs> and, and hoping to get to main engine cutoff like that. And so um, the, only, the only thing I requested of the flight, the crew on the flight deck is don't say, uh-oh, without, <laughs> without an immediate explanation as to what that means. I think the last inspiration word you're gonna spread very short to the younger generation. What would be? Study hard. Great. Yeah, yeah, I would echo the same thing. And it's, you know, just study, education, manner of performance, manner of performance, manner of performance. Whether that's education, whether that's a work assignment, whether that's, you know, helping a friend down the street. You know, always do your best. The other thing I would say is always look for the best in people, right? Everybody has a good side, everybody has a bad side, but always look for the best in people. Um, I would say keep dreaming big, but think as well of the planet and like what you can contribute to it. So make a better impact on somebody else's life and your surroundings.
Thank you very much for having you today. I really appreciate it. Girls are so happy that you are. Okay, they honored having an interview with you today. Thank you. Okay. Great questions, everyone. Yeah, Thank, you. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you.